In this class, there's a lot of material to present. I've prepared a lot of things to present to you, and it's quickly becoming apparent that we're running out of time. The end of the semester is coming, and we've got a lot of material that I'm not even going to have time to present. So these two video lectures over Thanksgiving will give us some opportunity to catch up and at least have two additional lectures to what we'd have without these. So today, I want to talk about respiration and metabolism. And this fits in very well with what we've been talking about so far in terms of, of consumption and digestion. You've seen that sharks, skates, and rays, compared to bony fish and compared to other vertebrates, have a relatively low level of consumption and they have a relatively slow rate of digestion or passage of food through their digestive systems. That obviously puts a limit on how much energy they're intaking into their bodies and how much energy is available for other things. Well, like a lot of topics in this class, this idea of respiration metabolism gives us an idea, gives us an opportunity to re review a major concept in biology, and that is energetics. So before we get specifically to shark skates and rays, I want to not, not go into very much detail, but I just want to remind you of some of the basic concepts that we're talking about that you learned about years ago in a biology class. You probably have repeated in a, a few biology classes while you've been in college. And so I want to talk about these five different things. The first couple will be not specific to sharks, skates, and rays, but specific to how food is converted to an energy form that can be used by organisms. So first of all, sharks, skates, and rays, they're no different than any other living thing. One of the characteristics of life, or living things, is that they have energy requirements. Every living thing needs energy. Sharks and skates and rays are no different. They need energy, and they use a lot of energy for metabolism. Metabolism is basically supplying the needs of the body to be able to swim, to be able to run, to be able to fly, whatever it is the animal's doing. If you move, even for sedentary animals, or they, they might wave something through the water, or they're pumping water through their bodies. There's a lot of other things that energy is used for metabolically. Basically, you're making ATP to do work in cells and muscles and, and all kinds of different parts of the body. We also saw the other day that that energy can be channeled towards growth. If you've got excess energy, you can deposit what you've eaten after it's been converted to some different form to tissue as protein carbohydrate, some kind of structural thing. You can grow, and then if you're a mature animal, you can channel some energy towards reproduction. Reproduction can be expensive at times when you're making eggs and you're making sperm or you're trying to find a mate or mating or, or uh, having young develop inside of your body. It can be quite energetically expensive. And there's also some energy that's lost in the feces and urine, energy that's consumed that's not available for them to use metabolically, and so it's lost. And so the energy to supply all these needs comes obviously from eating food. And we looked at the rate at which sharks and skates and rays consume food and saw that, it, that it's relatively low. Well, every animal has its own energy needs. Some are very active, have a really high metabolic rate, like warm-blooded animals, birds and mammals. It takes a lot of energy to heat their bodies, first of all, and then they're, they're usually pretty active, so it takes a lot of energy to support their muscles and their locomotion. So, not surprisingly, warm-blooded animals have a high metabolic rate compared to cold-blooded animals. But even if you're looking at different kinds of fish or different kinds of sharks and skates and rays, they all demonstrate different levels of activity. Some are very active and use a lot of energy, and some are a lot more 
benthic laying on the bottom or they're in really cold water and they have relatively low metabolic rates, low energy needs. But ultimately, the amount of energy that an organism can acquire by eating, in this case, has a huge influence on what that animal does in terms of its biology and, and ecology, in terms of its physiology, in terms of its evolution. How much energy an organism has has a huge impact on that organism, on that species. They've all got different energy demands. And then, of course, energy is being channeled from one organism to another to another through we try and keep track of those as trophic levels. Well, I want to talk for a minute about this idea of food as fuel. You know, we eat food. Sharks, skates, and rays eat food. Bony fish eat food. Different types of food. But the purpose of eating food is the food itself is not used to do work. The food itself is not used to pump ions across the cell membrane or for muscles to contract or any of those things. Food is a form of chemical energy. There's different food types, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids primarily. And those can be broken down in the machinery of cells and the mitochondria primarily with a whole bunch of different enzymes. That food can be broken down and used to make a form of energy that can be used to do work. And everybody knows that form of energy is ATP, the energy currency of the cell. There's a, some other forms of energy that can be used to do work, but it's primarily ATP, and everything can use ATP to do work. So the goal, then, is to convert food, or the parts of food, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, as they're broken down into small components, convert those into ATP and then use ATP. The ATP has to be replenished. You have to take a phosphate and stick it on an ADP to make ATP. And then you have more energy. That's, that's what we're always doing. Sharks, skates, rays, and other animals are consuming food to make ATP. That's what life is all about. Well, if you want to know what the energetic demands of an organism are, then really it's how much ATP they're using. They need a certain amount of ATP to support a certain level of activity. The less active you are, the less energy you need, then the less ATP you're going to be using. The less ATP you're going to be synthesizing. You don't need to supply as much energy. The more active you are and the higher your level of activity, then the more ATP you need, the more ATP you're going to be synthesizing, probably the more food you're going to be consuming in order to supply the energy that's going to be used to make that ATP. If you could measure that, that would tell you what the metabolic rate is of an organism. How much energy are they using per unit time? Metabolic rate. Well, the problem with that approach is it's difficult to measure ATP. It would be very straightforward. How much ATP is used within a certain period of time? Metabolic rate. But the reality is that it's difficult to measure ATP. So let's talk about another concept that you guys all know, you're all familiar with, is that for the Krebs cycle and the electron transport system, for food to enter into those metabolic pathways, there's a requirement of oxygen. And oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the electron transport system. If oxygen isn't present, then the acetyl-CoA doesn't go into the Krebs cycle. It goes towards producing lactic acid. There's animals that can tolerate, including us, that can tolerate anaerobic conditions for a short time. You can you can make ATP without oxygen, but then you, you're not making as much, and that changes the pH of your blood and tissues. You've got to repay that oxygen debt, and then those materials, lactic acid, can be converted into a form that can go into the Krebs cycle. There's bacteria can 
undergo anaerobic respiration all the time, certain types of bacteria. But the, the bottom line is that oxygen is required. Oxygen is used in order to fully metabolize an energy source like glucose or some protein, amino acids. You need oxygen to get the, the full amount of energy out of a, a food that you consume. And so, not surprisingly, if you look at animals, early on, their development of some kind of big respiratory surface, if not an entire respiratory system, then a respiratory surface. Sometimes some animals use gills for respiration and other things. Some animals use their body surface or other structures where there's a lot of surface area in contact with water to extract oxygen. But it's one of the things that happened early on in animals was the development, the evolution of respiratory systems. Whether you're on land and extracted oxygen from the air or whether you're in the water and extracted oxygen from the water. The, the, there's a big surface area where there's a, a contact between either air or water and the organism and there's a lot of blood that's delivered to those respiratory surfaces so that you can have oxygen diffuse out of the water, diffuse out of the air into the blood if they've got a circulatory system. And then that oxygen is delivered to all these tissues that are respiring and using oxygen, burning fuel. And so you get the maximum amount of ATP that's generated from food. Well, you can take advantage of this idea this relationship between oxygen if you look at this equation down here it it summarizes cellular respiration you probably recognize this that there's one molecule of glucose in the presence of oxygen a certain amount of oxygen is used to generate atp that energy coming out of the bottom of this equation is atp and then the waste products are carbon dioxide and water you could also use carbon dioxide to see how much ATP is being used. But it's easy to measure oxygen consumption. And in fact, the rate of oxygen consumption is constant in relation to how much ATP is being synthesized. So if you want to know how much ATP is being synthesized to be used by the animal, that's hard to do. But if you know how much oxygen is being consumed to make ATP, that's easy to do relatively, relative to uh, measuring ATP. It's pretty easy to measure oxygen consumption. And because there's a constant relationship between the amount of oxygen used and the amount of ATP produced, oxygen is a good proxy for being able to estimate ATP production, or in other words, you can use oxygen to measure metabolic rate. So let's talk about that metabolic rate. Well, if you're thinking about a, an organism out there, thinking about ourselves or a shark or skate or ray, obviously they go through different levels of activity within their lives and within a, within a day. Sometimes they're laying on the bottom and then they get up and swim around actively looking for food, or maybe they're trying to avoid a predator. Well, when they're laying on the bottom, they've got a low metabolic rate, low energy demands, low rate of oxygen consumption. When they're up off the bottom swimming around, they're going to have a lot higher level of activity, energy needs, more ATP being used and synthesized to replace that, and more oxygen being used. We've also got different organisms. This uh, ray that's laying on the bottom is going to have a lower level of activity than a mako shark. And what that means is less ATP used or lower metabolic rate, less oxygen used. Or if, if you could measure the amount of oxygen that was consumed by a ray versus a mako shark, you could get an idea of the you could compare their metabolic rates and see this one's using a lot of oxygen, this one's using a lot less. What does that mean? The oxygen is directly related to how much ATP is being synthesized. You can use that as a 
as a means of measuring metabolic rate. There's also big differences between different sized animals. If you're big, you've got more muscle, you've got a bigger mass to move. So you're using different levels of ATP if you're big compared to if you're small. Even within the same animal, when you're a certain age and com compare your metabolic rate at that age to when you're a different age, they're going to differ, different sizes. So what's typically done is it, this idea of metabolic rate doesn't mean much unless you standardize it. Standardize it in terms of making it a rate the unit of time, usually hours, could be minutes, and what you're measuring again is oxygen. How much oxygen is used per unit time, that's a rate, that's a metabolic rate. It's a proxy for how much ATP is used per unit time, which is basically the metabolic rate. Well, if you throw in the size consideration as well, then What's typically expressed when you're measuring oxygen consumption, when you're trying to quantify the metabolic rate, is mil something like milliliters of oxygen consumed per gram of body weight per hour. If it's a big animal, then it'd probably be per kilogram. It could also be per minute. And in that way, you could get the metabolic rate of an organism. If you knew how much it weighed, and you knew how much oxygen it used within a certain period of time, you could quantify that as metabolic rate, and that's, that's done quite often. Well, as I said, they, animals go through different levels of activity, so what people try and do is quantify the range of activities that an animal experiences. So the first thing to try and quantify is the resting state, or basal metabolism, it's hard to do with things like obligate swimmers that never stop swimming. But you, you try and get to this point where they're at rest, if it's something that lays on the bottom. They're not expending that much energy. Or if they're constantly swimming, then it's the, the minimal amount of energy that they're using to, to do this low level of activity. The minimal amount of ATP that they're, they're burning, the minimal amount of oxygen that they're using, basal metabolic rate, and then all the way up to as active as they are, as fast as they can swim, and as much energy as they can generate. Of course, there's a, a big differences between different organisms. Some sluggish animals, they just can't generate very much ATP. They just don't, they never experience a high metabolic rate because they, they don't experience that in their daily comings and goings. Whereas there's other ones that can swim really fast and they can really elevate their metabolic rate. They can really generate a lot of ATP. They can really consume a lot of oxygen. So this whole range is the metabolic scope of an organism. 